Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Welcome to Hare Krishna today. On today's program, we have a special guest with us. His grace, Hari Chakra Das from Ghana. Hari Chakra Prabhu, welcome to Hare Krishna today. Hare Krishna. Hari Chakra Prabhu, he specializes in dealing with interreligious dialogue, harmonizing people. Now we know there are a lot of people in the world who blame religion because they think that religion creates a lot of problem in society. Let me give some examples. Some people say, for example, Jesus Christ is the truth, the way and the life. No one cometh unto the Father but by Him, and everybody else go to hell. Somebody may say, there's only one God, Allah and Muhammad is His own, only messenger, and so everybody else is condemned. Hari Chakrapu, can you say how, what, we can do that people can understand that actually we can all believe in the different religions and still learn to love each other and grow. How would you respond to that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> the, the, this issue has been a big issue in, uh, worldwide. It's not limited to any particular country or race. Worldwide, People have been having that problem of uh, religious sectarianism and denomination. Uh, everybody is thinking that his religion is the best and that if you don't belong to his religion, then you are doomed. But uh, it's very unfortunate because if, you happen, if we, we happen to have gotten Jesus, Muhammad, uh, Srila Prabhupada, Buddha, all these personalities to come together now, to not this. so like they will fight. Then all the, their followers will realize that they were all speaking about one same thing. But they were giving the message according to time, place, and circumstances. And again, according to the level of intelligence of the people they were speaking to. Uh, take for instance, uh, when Jesus said, when uh, Philip asked Jesus in, my, in uh, uh, John chapter 14, uh, verse 5, he said, uh, just show us the way, and I think it's enough for us. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh to the Father but by me. Uh, this statement that Jesus made, a lot of Christians are thinking it, it, it's an, like an exclusive statement. That if you are not uh, calling yourself a follower of Christ, then there's no way you can get to God. But the unfortunate thing is, People only quote the verse 6 and make their argument on that verse. But if you go two verses later, mm -hmm. Philip went further to ask Jesus, uh, all these teachings you are giving us, I think if you just show us the Father, then that is okay. Then Jesus said, have I been with you all these years and you don't even know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Again, some Christians are saying that because of that statement, then Jesus is God himself. Okay. But he didn't stop there. You go to verse 10, and he says that, don't you know that everything that I'm telling you is not from me, but the Father who resides in me, he gives him the ability to say these things. And if even you don't want to believe anything, just believe in what the Father is asking me to say. So he's making a distinction. He's making a distinction that the Father within him, which is the super soul, mm -hmm. is telling him what to say. So he is like representing the Father. Of course, there are other statements like, in my Father's kingdom, no one coming up to the Father but by me. He, 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 even, he even explained it vividly when you go to John chapter 12, from verse 37. He clearly states that, don't you know that Everything I'm saying to you is the Father who has sent me to say it. I'm representing Him, and because I'm representing Him, all that I'm saying is what the Father is saying. 
And because I'm representing him, if you see me, you have seen the Father. I mean, this thing is properly explained for us to understand. We know even in this material world, like let's take for instance, the president of this country. If we, we are having a program and we invite the president of this country to come, and the president doesn't come by himself, but he sends a, a boy, of, a five-year-old boy, to come and represent him. When the five-year-old boy comes, where do you think we have to put him? On a side chair or somewhere? Definitely, for, as a respect for the president, we have to put the five-year-old boy in the seat of the president. And whilst the function is going on, anything this five-year-old boy say is what the president is saying. If he says, I'm giving a donation of $1 million, it means the president is giving a donation of $1 million. So if we disrespect this boy, it's a direct disrespect to the president. So similarly, Jesus came as a representative of the Supreme Law, and not only him. Similar statements have been made in other scriptures, like the Quran. In the Quran, it is stated that there is no religion pleasing to the eyes of Allah except Islam. But he didn't remain there. If you go to Surah 2, verse 136, he mentioned certain things. He called the names of different prophets, lined them up, and he goes further to tell you that if even you abandon any one of these prophets, you will not be accepted by Allah. I mean, these things are there to let us understand that religion really is one. There is no two religions. There is only one religion, but religious faith, people are now trying to turn religious faith into real religion. Real religion means complete surrender to the will of God. And this is what the Quran says. Uh, in the Quran, uh, Islam means complete surrender to the will of Allah. Now, if you come to the Bhagavad Gita, let's hear what Lord Krishna himself says. Lord Krishna also says that, abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender unto me. I will deliver you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. So he could decide to abandon everybody else too. <laughs> so, what does this statement mean? You go to the purport and Shla Prabhupada perfectly explains in the purport that Krishna is saying that when we say religion, uh, he was talking and Krishna is talking about all these uh, system, steps of religion uh, Astanga Yoga, Karma Yoga, Gyanda Yoga all these different types of uh, religious processes and Krishna is telling us that the ultimate goal of all these processes is to surrender unto me and hence he's telling you why worry yourself with all these processes if you have the ability to just surrender your will to me, that is it. So, various religion, religions are telling us that the ultimate thing is to surrender completely to God. And that's why, biblically, when the Pharisees went to Jesus and they said, uh, what is the greatest principle of God? Jesus said, to love the Lord thy God with thy whole mind, thy whole body, and thy whole soul. I mean, that is the ultimate thing. All these scriptures are telling us the same message. To love God with our whole mind, our whole body, and our whole soul. So why are we now trying to make it into another thing? God is not a confused God. He's not a God who will tell you something, one thing up somewhere and tell you another thing at another place. But we must be able to understand why he said certain things at certain places. Let me quickly chip in this thing. Um, if I'm teaching class one people, uh, children in class one, one plus one is two. There are some of the students, I will just stand in front of the blackboard and I'll write one plus one. And if I say one plus one, how much is it? One child may raise his hand and say, oh, one plus two, answer. Some of the children will not even understand it. I have to go out, bring some stones. And I will tell them, one, pull it, and they will pull it. Plus one, pull another, and they will pull it. Then I will ask them, How, what is the answer? And they will go again to the table and count it. One plus one. Then they will raise their hand, two. <laughs> so those children who use stone to understand one plus one, the stone becomes the way, the truth, and the life. They can never, never pass one plus one except through stones. <laughs> That doesn't mean that the one who just understood one plus one on the blackboard, if he writes to, he's wrong. 
So similar, the ultimate goal of religion is for us to completely surrender our will to the to God. So it doesn't matter the process we are taking through. We can call the process any name: Islam, Christianity, uh, Hinduism, whatever. But as long as we achieve the ultimate goal of complete surrender to the will of God, we are qualified to go back to God. Perhaps we could look at another principle that is actually universal, although someone may say the only name of God. We know in all religions they prescribe or recommend the chanting of the names of God. However, someone will still think it's only this. Right? So perhaps you could speak about how this, this one universal principle in religion and the holy names could actually help to solve problems. Yeah, God is so powerful that we are told that he is not different, he is not different from his name. God is not like man, God is not like uh, uh, water, that you, if you are thirsty and you start chanting water, 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 you don't get satisfied by just chanting water. But God, God is not different from his name. And especially in this age of hypocrisy and quarrel, God knows that we are so degraded, human beings are so degraded in this age that just on trivial issues, it brings a big war. So he knows that the ancient times when we have to sit down and meditate perfectly on him, we, are, we don't have that ability. So in his own costless mood, he, has, he says he has made himself available in his name and that this name should be our, our object of meditation. Human beings, we are addicted in fixing our minds on something. So God says, my name. So, like, if you close your eye, you ask a lot of people, when you close your eye, what do you see? They generally see darkness. So if you want to meditate on God, what should you fix your mind on? God says, my name, fix your mind on my name. And that is why all the great scriptures that are, he's given us now, they are all putting emphasis on chanting of his name. One thing we should be clear of, when we use the word chanting, it baffles a lot of people. People say, oh, chanting is something Hinduism. Chanting is something from India or something. No, chanting is just an English word. In the dictionary, chanting means a repetition. If I say father, it's a word, but if I repeat it, Father, 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 I'm chanting the word Father. So when we say a prayer once, it's just a prayer. When we repeat that prayer, it's chanting the prayer. And God wants us to chant his names. Now, some, some people ask that the Bible says that the Lord says in the Bible that thou shalt not put the Lord thy, the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And people are interpreting it that if you chant the names of God, then it's like you are putting the Lord, the name of the Lord of, of God, uh, the Lord God in vain. No. When we say, when the Bible said that thing, he meant that it's like as you are here now, if I start calling you, uh, Prabhu, Prabhu, and when you turn to me, I also look the other way. Then I'm putting your name in vain. So what people refuse to understand is that even though they are trying to call God, but at the same time, they've turned their way looking at material nature. In other words, they are calling the name of God, and at the same time, their whole heart is fixed on progress in material things. As a matter of fact, some religious people would want to believe these religious people, they are our enemy. These religious people are our enemy. But do you think it is really materialism is the real enemy over indulgence and sin gratification rather than other religious people? Yeah, before I even come to that question, I want to just complete what we were just discussing about this holy name of God. Yes. So, that holy name of God is so powerful that whoever calls sincerely from his heart the name of God, God says, I will save you. Okay. And that is why biblically, in Romans 10, 13, he says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He repeats the same thing in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 21. He says, during the end times, things will be so difficult that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the David, David also said it in the Psalms, in Psalm 113, verse 3. He says, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun, you should call on the name of the Lord. I mean, come to hear it from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun. 
you should call on the name of the Lord. Then ask yourself, how many times do I call on the name of God? Now, in the Quran, in Surah 17, verse 110, there is an emphasis that all beautiful names belong to Allah, and whosoever shall call on these names shall be saved. Then in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna also explains, the Lord himself says that, of all sacrifices, nothing is so pleasing to me than the calling on my holy names. So these great books are all telling us that the calling of the names of God is so important in our lives. And instinctively, it's, we also know, every human being instinctively knows that there is power in the name of God. But we will never call the name unless until we are in trouble. An example is, usually when we sit in a vehicle, we talk about so many unnecessary things. Politics, my wife, my family, my business, so many other things, distractions. Then we completely forget about God. But in the process of traveling, if somehow or the other, the car falls into a ditch, immediately we forget about business, we forget about family, we forget everything material. Then the only thing that comes to mind automatically is God. The Hindu will be chanting Krishna, Ram, the Muslim will be chanting Allah, uh, the Christian will be chanting, oh Christ, oh Jesus. So if we know that the name is so powerful that it can save us from a situation, why do we wait until there is a problem before we call the name? And that is why these scriptures are telling us that by meditating on these names of God, calling on the name of God, once you call the name, it is recommended you pronounce the name a little bit audibly and hear the name you are saying and that should become your object of meditation and the more it becomes pure the more your pronouncement of the name of God becomes pure it cleanses your heart and gradually this name will start taking form for you to do what? to be able to visualize the real form of the Lord because if your heart is purified then you can visualize the Lord and that's why in Matthew 5, 8, it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So the holy name of God is so important in our life. Now, let's come to the question you just asked. About yeah, some people say, these people are our enemy, these people are the problem. But actually, the competition in the world today is materialism. Would you say that's like the, where the real challenge lies? Yeah, people know. I mean... Come to think of it, even common sense, let's common sense, let's speak from the point of view of common sense. The Muslim says he's worshipping God. The Christian says he's worshipping God. The Hindu says he's worshipping God. Now, when all these three people meet, they fight among themselves. What about if they meet the fourth person who says there is no God? Then what would they do with him? <laughs> if the three of you who accept that there is a God you are fighting, what about if you meet someone who says there is no God? <laughs> so, if, for you to be able to even face the one who says there is no God, then in the first place, the three of you should unite and understand that we have a common goal. Because divided we fall, and united we stand. So, if we already we are divided, then we cannot even face the person who says there is no God. So the idea is, we should understand ourselves that even though we are all heading towards one goal, but we are go approaching the goal in different parts, in different angles. So we should be able to understand ourselves that our goal is one. Let's put our heads together and achieve this goal. And in this way, there can be peace and harmony in this world. Actually, religion is the best process to give peace. But unfortunately, because people are diverting it in a different way, now it's become the, the, the biggest problem in this world. Well, you think, it, is, is it a scapegoat like, you know, we give religion a bad name, give a dog a bad name and hang it. So we say religion causing confusion, so we could turn to materialism and dive into it and enjoy ourselves. Is it like we try to blame religion, yet that causing trouble. Yeah, because human nature, the human nature is such that we don't want rules and regulations. And because human nature, every day the humans want to escape rules and regulations, then anything that brings root, that, that is, I mean, goes with rules and regulations. We try to uh, give it a bad name so that we wouldn't have anything to do with it. So because religion has got some restrictions with it, 
People don't like those restrictions. They just want to go live free. You, you I mean, go to town and see. There are people who are homeless. They don't even have a place to lay their heads. It's difficult for them to even get a, 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 a day's meal. But you go and ask them, oh, come on, come to my house and uh, live with me. I'll feed you, you have a place to sleep. But there are rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. You can't go out without any permission. You can't, immediately you start putting the rules and regulations, they are not interested. They want to live out there and suffer. And that is the nature of this world. People want to live out there and suffer because when they try to approach God, they know God is going to tell them, call my name. But what is difficult about this? Come to think of it. Somebody is prepared to feed you for free. God is feeding you for free. He is ready to give you whatever you need. But he only says that your only part of the deal is that <laughs> you every morning just knock at my door and glorify me. Just say, oh, thank you very much. Oh, God, you are so magnanimous that you have fed, you have fed me. And just say this thing. And we say it's difficult. Mm. We don't want to even do that. But... Interesting. If we look at it from a non-believer's point of view, right? The non-believer would see. But the majority of people in the world, they're not atheists, they're religious people. So why are there so many catastrophes, problems in the world? The majority of people are religious people. So what's the problem with your religion now? Yeah, because uh, people even though claim to be religious people, by the truth, and they are not religious. They are even more atheistic than any other person. Now, that's, wow. a heavy, that's a heavy point you made. Yeah. The, the point is, the point is, uh, I claim I'm religious, but the things that are concerned with religion, I'm not interested in following it. You know, how, then how religious I am? I mean, take for instance, let me break it down. Let's take a, a, an issue in the Bible as an example. When Jesus was telling his disciples how to pray, in Matthew chapter 6, from verse 25, he says, when ye are praying, don't pray for, to God for what you clothe yourself with, because it is not necessary. And he gave an example, look at the ladies of the water. They don't farm, they don't toil, they, they have no bars, they have no silos to keep anything in. But the clothes that God has given them, even Solomon in all his glory, never had any clothes as beautiful as the ladies. Then again he said, when you are asking something from God, don't even ask what you eat. Look at the birds of the air. They have no farms. They don't have any barns to keep their wares in. But every time they wake up, God flies them to where they will get food. He's feeding them. So how much more you that you have dedicated your life to, you are trying to dedicate your life to him. You think he will leave you alone? So in verse 33, in the same chapter 6, he says, so if you are asking something from God, ask for his kingdom and his righteousness, and all others he shall automatically add to you. Then Krishna also says in the Bhagavad Gita, that if you become my devotee, I will preserve all that you have, and I will carry what you lack. All these assurances are there, yet we think we can make our own provisions, we think we can, we can fail for ourselves. And instead of trying to tilt our desires to satisfy God, we are always trying to we tilt our desires for our own personal lasting desire, uh, satisfaction. And this is what is causing problem in religion today. Because now people are shifting, they are shifting. You see, the thing is supposed to be like this in a balanced form, but people are going this way and they still want to be balanced. It's not possible. You have to be go by the tenets of the system, and you get. Krishna is so powerful. Krishna is so merciful, and everything he has created, created in this world is for our own benefit. In his kingdom, he doesn't lack anything. But for me and you, because of me and you, sometimes he descends to this world. Sometimes he sends his prophets just to come and teach us how to live our life so that we can come back home back to him. All right, Jacob Prabhu, we've exhausted our time on this program, but surely we're going to continue our discussion in the following program. So thank you very much for being on the program. Thank you very much. Sai so Raja Shida saying Hare Krishna, and do join us again next week for a continuing presentation. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. <laughs>
Come on. 